and I am with the city of Guelph. Um, along with colleagues at the county of Wellington, we've been leading um, a smart cities initiative for the past few years called Our Food Future, which I will be discussing in more detail momentarily. <clears throat> and I'll also be the moderator for today's discussion. At our round table today, I'm joined by some amazing uh, thought leaders and practitioners in this space. Um, but before I introduce them, uh, we'd love to know more information about the folks in the audience for our session. So on the right panel of your screen, you should see a poll that is now live. Um, if you wouldn't mind completing that, just letting us know uh, the types of folks who are in attendance. Um, I just realized when I was filling it out myself that we forgot to leave a button there for municipal or local government. So if you are municipal or local government, please just use the, the other option. Um, and we'll assume there's lots of those folks because cities love, uh, love circular food. Um, so on the panel today, um, we have uh, Andrea Margarini, who's the coordinator of the city of Milan's food policy office and also the chair of the Euro cities working group on food. Uh, welcome, Andrea. Um, yep. We have yes, Tamara Strickland, who is the lead for urban systems with metabolic, a consultancy based in the Netherlands. Welcome, Tamara. And we have uh, Dana Gunders. The executive director of Refed, a US based nonprofit um, focused on ending food loss and waste using data driven solutions. Uh, welcome, Dana. So, before we get into to the, today's discussion, let me provide a quick overview of the agenda and uh, a few housekeeping items. Um, to set the stage, we'll first begin with each panelist providing around five to seven minute brief presentation. Uh, with examples of how their organization is approaching the circular food economy um, and lessons learned. Following that, we'll open up to a roundtable discussion um, with questions from the audience. Throughout the session, uh, you should be able to see a Q&A tab just on the, on the right-hand side of the screen. Please use that to submit any questions throughout that we can, we can pull from. We really are hoping for some good audience interaction today. Um, we'd also welcome you to use the chat function to share your thoughts or tell us about uh, food projects going on in your part of the world. So we can all learn more and, and pull that together as, a, as part of a global community. So uh, do we have answers for this poll yet, Raven? Not sure if that's come up on the screen. I'm not sure if I can see them, but uh, we will go through those um, poll results in a moment. Um, but to start, um, I just want to do a quick level set around um, circular food systems. Oh, there we are. Um, so it looks like we have a significant folks from other, which I meet, assume a number of whom are uh, local governments. Also, national and provincial governments seem to have uh, a good number in attendance as well. So to begin, um, I wanted to do a quick level set around the food system and some of the factors that make it interesting or distinct when we think about creating circular um, food, uh, food systems. So it, it shouldn't surprise too many folks that there are the food system we have right now, the linear food system is far from ideal. Um, it's high impact, producing between a quarter and a third of global greenhouse gas emissions, depending on how you measure. Um, it's also tremendously wasteful, with approximately a third of food produced globally going to waste. And in, in many countries, especially in richer countries like Canada, it can be much higher. The irony, of course, is that there's also a tremendous population globally that doesn't have access to enough food, whether in developed countries or, or lesser developed countries. And we face epidemics of nutrition related diseases um, from diseases of scarcity to um, ones of overabundance like uh, obesity and, and type two diabetes. The food system is also a tremendous source of other types of pollution um, that cause problems, uh, including plastics waste. So while the food system has tremendous problems, it's also been identified by many as uh, one of the key sectors and the, and the greatest opportunities for circular economy transformation. 
Um, food touches on all of us and changing the food system has tremendous potential to deliver economic, social and environmental benefits. And food is also one of the few sectors that touches all 17 sustainable development goals. So I'm going to assume most attendees understand something of the circular economy, um, but there are a few factors um, I want to touch on that I think make food a little bit distinct. And, and I'm sure the other presenters will talk about these more uh, throughout their, uh, their presentations. So first, when we think about food material itself, there is tremendous potential to upcycle uh, food waste and organic materials. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the, uh, the concept of the reverse pyramid of, of food recovery, and it's, it's less a matter of whether something can be upcycled from landfill as to what is the higher value we can generate for that particular material, be it composting, creating new food for animals or people, or uh, developing bioplastics, and there was, a, there was a great presentation on that yesterday. Second, the scale of the food supply chain is, is immense. From family farms to multinational agriculture giants and corner stores and hot dog stands. So when we think about systemic solutions in, in the food sector, we need to be thinking about a range of different scales and a, and a wide breadth of stakeholders. It's not in any way one size fits all. Third, food production connects cities with the surrounding rural areas that feed them. And a circular food system needs to ensure that those rural communities are vibrant and that sustainable farming practices are themselves financially sustainable. Um, we also need to think about the impacts on land and on soil health and biodiversity. Last, food is essential to life. It's at the core of our communities and our culture and access to food is a right. So thinking about the food system, it's not just about managing a bunch of organic materials. It's also about inclusion and justice and building strong communities. In Canada, for instance, we think a lot about providing access to culturally appropriate food and community to uh, diverse immigrants and community groups. Uh, we also think about learning traditional food ways from indigenous elders and communities. So none of these factors are necessarily unique to the food system, but they add additional dimensions that need to be considered when we're thinking about food systems change. So now I'd like to tell you a bit about the project I represent um, in Guelph and Wellington County. Um, we are located approximately 45 minutes outside of Toronto. Guelph is well known in Canada and North America for our expertise in food. Much of this comes from the University of Guelph, which is a global leader in agricultural science and, and food. Um, but we also have a significant presence of, of government agencies around food located here. We have a strong agri-food and agri-tech business cluster. And we're located inside Wellington County. We're surrounded by Wellington County, which has some of the, the finest uh, farmland in the world and a, and a vibrant agriculture sector. So a few years ago, when we started to design a, a combined smart cities project with the county, um, food was the obvious place for us to look. And thinking about this theme of, of driving social and econ economic innovation, um, we started there by really creating a shared vision. Considering the, the wide breadth of the food system and all the stakeholders involved, we spent a lot of time having conversations and really setting three core targets around increasing access to affordable, nutritious food, um, creating an environment that supports new circular food businesses and collaborations, and putting in place initiatives and incentives to unlock the value of food waste. Um, we also set the timeline to, to achieve these targets by the end of 2025. So with um, this, uh, this shared vision in place, we moved it into implementation. And the implementation of our vision really relied on the entire community. And we now work with a network of around 150 organizations um, across the food supply chain from food relief to municipal solid waste and food businesses. Um, our project leadership is widely distributed around a network of, of core collaborators. So a tremendous amount is happening all at the same time, 
But through this, this living lab network that we've created, we're able to facilitate unique collaborations between startup businesses and food relief organizations. Um, we're able to, to balance resources and, and connect the municipal solid waste department to urban farms or, or other food providers. Um, and any innovator or innovation that comes into our area finds this, this test bed and this, this built in support system all dedicated to achieving this circular food region vision, um, which has been a key for us. We've also put a major emphasis, especially in the first half of our initiative around using data and technology to understand our current state. So interventions are eventually designed down the line to have the maximum impact. So we have a, a central data hub, which combines all the different data sets we can find related to our regional food economy. We've done work with metabolic in, in mapping food material flows, which Tamara is gonna speak more about in a moment. Um, but beyond materials, our colleagues in, in the public health space are mapping the lived experience of residents and, and tracking nutritional and, and the food access environments. So we're really trying to get a holistic view of, of how uh, the environment works for food materials and for people. We're also developing new ways of generating data. The, uh, the background of this slide is from an AI technology we've been developing uh, for the past few months with a company called Eagle Vision, along with the University of Guelph to provide data on unnecessary food waste collected through the residential organic waste program. So as you can see, the AI um, has, put a, has put a box around what looks to be a half of a watermelon, marking it as unnecessary food waste, along with a few other bags marked as contaminant. So this tool at this point, it can detect um, five broad waste and contaminant streams with over 90% accuracy. And the hope is that this technology will eventually provide real time data uh, so we can plan interventions and education programs matched with geography that can be highly targeted uh, towards achieving uh, food waste goals. So thinking about economic and business innovation, we're um, pursuing a range of different strategies. One is challenges. The AI tool I, I just mentioned came together through a civic accelerator challenge where we, we put out a call with a small amount of money for a business to work with the city to develop that solution. Um, and two weeks ago, we launched another competitive challenge where uh, we were calling for teams between three to seven companies to prototype circular innovations um, in their existing supply chain with the best solution receiving additional funding to scale up. Another big focus of ours is around uh, facilitation and collaborations um, between different companies. The background of this slide is um, from an amazing collaboration that uh, our, our partners ProVision Coalition uh, worked on last year, where they brought together seven different organizations, including a, a brewery, an insect farm, a fish hatchery, a potato farm, and others, to create a series of fully circular gourmet meals served at restaurants across our community. Um, We've also launched uh, mentorship programs and a material exchange platform, something like Craigslist for food waste to really try and surface waste materials and build more B2B connections. We're also providing tailored support for circular entrepreneurs through our COIL Accelerator, which um, just launched in April. Um, through this project, we've currently supported approximately 160 small businesses or B2B collaborations which over the next few years, we hope to continue to grow considerably as we pull more and more companies into this uh, test bed that we've designed here. So thinking about the social side, um, we're using similar strategies here uh, to advance social innovation. So we put together challenges around increasing food access, but rather than a straight competitive challenge, which made sense in the business uh, stream, we're working collaboratively and working on shared budgeting across a number of different food relief and social organizations, um, which led to unique collaborations and a sharing of resources to really maximize the impact in a, in a diverse set of communities. We're also working to support social enterprise as a key uh, aspect of our work. So our colleagues at 10C recently launched uh, the Harvest Impact Fund as a social finance fund focused on social enterprise and we have amazing initiatives like Groceries from the Seed, um, which is a, a pay what you can delivery service that for every regular price, every, every regular price purchase from uh, a member of the community, two families get access to groceries at a discount of up to 
So it's a real way of flipping this sort of food bank model in the online delivery, delivery space. So these are a few examples of the strategies and the intervention we're doing in Guelph. Um, and I look forward to dis discussing these and, and other aspects more in the roundtable session. So thank you. And with that, I will turn it over to Tamara for her presentation. David, um, I'm just waiting to share my ad. Ah, there we go. All right. Share. And oh, present. So, hi, uh, thank you for having me. My name is Tamara Streefland. Um, and today I want to talk about uh, sustainable food systems of the future and then in particular urban food systems. So, we've all seen the stats. Cities are growing and it's projected that in 2050, over 80% of all food that is being produced will be consumed in cities. And already to feed our urban populations, we've come up with these massive supply chains and extractive economies to have this continuous supply of food. We have these massive monocultures, productive systems as we call them. We then use these primary crops and in some cases process them into products that are not always more nutritious than what it was before. We ship it all over the world until it comes in our grocery stores and enters the city, after which we can buy it and then put it on our plates. And along the way, lots of food is wasted, both avoidable and unavoidable. So to feed our populations, and not only urban, also global, we've um, created this massive agri-food complex that far extends the footprints that cities actually hold, putting too much pressure on our planet. So in other words, we've built a system to feed ourselves that relies too much on wild land. It uses too many pesticides and fertilizers, and there are too many emissions associated with it. This is not tenable, so we need to reimagine our food system. All right, so these are some of the impacts associated with that. Um, and I just want to say that lots of these impacts aren't visible in the city itself, but it is outside of the city and it's often addressing communities that are already marginalized and really encroaching and threatening the health of our ecosystems. So can we reimagine the urban food system and the food system in general? So how can we provide sufficient and nutritious food for all our inhabitants in a just and equitable way without crossing our planetary boundaries and undermining the functioning of our biosphere. So the region of Guelph Wellington is working exactly on this. And um, David already showed a bunch of the work that they've been doing, and it's really incredible to be part of this project. Um, we are specifically working on mapping the current state of uh, the food system. So really seeing what it looks like right now to identify high impact opportunities on top of what is already happening and formulating a strategic roadmap for Canada's first circular food economy. We don't do that alone. We do that together with um, the University of Guelph and a specific shout out to Mike from Massa, who's, who's, been, who's been awesome, and Dylan Consulting, and of course, together with our Food Futures team. I won't go into these goals because David has already um, assessed them. What I will go into is this current state assessment, because why do we do that? We want to understand what the food system looks like right now to identify high impact opportunities that can help us transform to a more sustainable state. So to do so, we often do material flow analyses. So we do that through the consumption lens, seeing what is being consumed in Guelph Wellington and then tracking that all the way back through the supply chain to see where it comes from and what are the impacts associated to that. But also looking at the production lens, what is produced in the region of Guelph Wellington and where is that actually going? So the result of that is a material flow analysis. So this is the one that tracks consumption. So what you see on the left is all the food that is being produced, following the supply chain to what is being processed, manufactured, distributed, and then enters the region of Guelph Wellington. So what you see here is that the thickness of the line is the quantity of food, so the amount, and then the different colors represent different types of food production. Going in a bit deeper, I'd like to show you what kind of insights we derive from that. So let's start with number one. Um, what is being consumed in Guelph Wellington? So if we track back, we see that the bulk or the majority of the food flows are fruits, cereals, vegetables, and starchy roots. So that sounds quite healthy, right? Um, 
And then if we move to two all the way into the region of Grail Wellington, we can see, um, and specifically households, we can see what is wasted. So households in Guelph Wellington waste um, about 25% of everything they purchase. And then if we dive deeper, two thirds of that could be avoided. That means we could have already, or actually eaten it. <laughs> now the region of Guelph Wellington is already working on that as part of the Our Foods future, but still it's quite an impressive stat. Now let's go to number three. So as you go through the material flow analysis, you'll see that the lines get thinner. That means that we're losing food. And that food is wasted. You see that the majority of that happens around processing. So if we look at storaging uh, and packaging loss and processing plant loss on the left side with the blue arrows, and I know that this gets quite deep, um, we can find some opportunities. So here we see that 35% of, of food that is wasted um, is actually avoidable uh, waste related to cereals and fruits. So this is an opportunity to then develop an impactful intervention that can alleviate some of that pressure. Now, we've seen that the majority of food uh, within Guelph Wellington is actually produced elsewhere. Um, so we wanna, and, and these impacts aren't always visible. So what we try to do is for every uh, crop, we also wanna see what the embedded impact of producing that is. So that's different than the mass. The mass can be very small, but then the impact can be large. If we look at different impact categories and then relate them to the crops. So the effect on climate change, but also looking at fresh water withdrawals and the effect on land use and how, um, yeah, and how that's being used. So that ties back to the diagram that I showed earlier of uh, the planetary boundaries and how the food system affects that. Now, we've mapped the current state and there's lots more to this. Like we've identified a lot of hotspots and opportunities together with our partners. So I'd very much like you to uh, look at the report so that you get the full image. Um, but also, where are we now? So we've identified the current state as a basis to look at these opportunities that can help us achieve our goals, right? Um, the next step is to identify opportunities. So for this project specifically, we are looking at avoidable and unavoidable food waste. So then we can talk about prevention, reuse, cascading, and also when it really, like there's no other option, disposal, preferably not, of course, in a circular economy. We are now working with local stakeholders and the broader our food futures team to identify what types of interventions are most impactful, how they relate to local policy and regulation, and also, um, um, sorry, um, and also how it relates to ex existing programs and stakeholder initiatives, and then finally, what is feasible for the stakeholders involved. Right, so that's the kind of framework we use to identify initiatives and then finally business cases because what we want to do at all times especially if metabolic is driving implementation so just to keep give you a couple of examples um preventing food waste can develop can be through uh, and this is not specific for guelph wellington but just some examples uh, you can develop food rescue programs to prevent food waste you can think about reusing certain types of waste as insect feed that can be converted to protein for feedstock uh, Protex is a great example for that. Or you can utilize unavoidable food waste and make something else out of it, such as fruit leather, so that we can get away from real leather. Um, finally, I'd like to go, uh, we talked about waste, right? Like in, the, in this project in Guelph Wellington, I do wanna make a note about production systems in urban areas as well, because we are also talking about uh, social innovation and, and, and uh, economic incentive, right? So one of the things we're doing with Metabolic that we're very excited about is our urban aquaponics farm, quite close to our office in the north of Amsterdam. Um, as part, um, so we've uh, been sponsored by EU program to develop this aquaponics farm, specifically focused on upgrading our current farm system, testing new high-tech and low-tech solutions that are scalable, and then also educating and training citizens about urban food production. And we wanna amplify this, right? So one of the key components of this research is to drive business innovation through open source blueprints so that every uh, community in the city can build their own aquaponics farm from uh, reused or recycled materials and can actually start producing their own food. Um, I'll leave it with this, uh, thank you. Now stop sharing. Thank you so much, Tamara. That was fantastic. Um, there, there was a question about uh, whether this session is being recorded and um, if slides will be available. 
and we will send around a link afterwards and have all of this available on our website, uh, including a link to the, to the full report from Metabolic. Um, next, uh, we have uh, Andrea to discuss some of the amazing leadership that uh, Milan has been showing in the food space for a number of years. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for my invitation. It's very a pleasure to be here today with you. I start sharing my screen. I hope that everything is work well. And so here we are. So I'm uh, Andrea. I'm the food policy coordinator of the city of Milan. And uh, we are trying working on the different field of action of our food system. Our food journey started in Milan in 2015 when we started studying uh, our food system. Uh, in that period, we hosted the World Expo uh, about feeding the planet, and our mayor decided to start a process to understand the different stages of a food system. And uh, so we produced this map, and uh, with this map, we put a lot of uh, the different labeling, the different boxes, to understand the different policy that we can apply uh, on the food system. And we discovered that uh, in that period, we have a lot of competencies as municipality, as local authority in the field of food system, but was spread within the administration in different departments, in different deputy mayors. And so with the food policy, we decided to have uh, an holistic uh, strategy to tackle uh, in uh, a coordinating approach uh, the different uh, elements of our food system. And so uh, after uh, six months of work, uh, our city council approved the Milan food policy, that is a set of uh, uh, key, uh, five key priorities, uh, 16 guidelines, and uh, one of the main priorities is to work against food waste. We noticed that uh, here you can see some data uh, on the different percentage of food waste and losses in the different stage of a food system, and we start working in uh, all of our municipal infrastructure regarding food. And so we organize a set of uh, community of practices, engaging uh, different local stakeholders, different shareholders, NGOs, charities, private sector, uh, to try to understand uh, on the different element of the food system, uh, the action that we can deliver. And uh, one of them uh, since 2018 was fully dedicated to food waste. Here you can uh, see some example of the result um, that we have done in this uh, in these years. Uh, again, uh, we, we, as municipal authority, we have uh, total control of some uh, key fundamental infrastructure of our food system. School canteens, for instance, and uh, general uh, vegetable market, wholesale market. Uh, with the school canteens, uh, we have a system in which uh, we serve per day 85,000 meal per day that are totally under the control of the municipality because uh, we establish a municipal agency and uh, we, we start, we manage from the raw material to uh, stock uh, that food, to transport, to produce, to produce the meal and to deliver in more than 600 of uh, uh, canteens. We started in 2060 a program to uh, save the bread and the fruit uh, that was edible, so that are food losses. Uh, and uh, nowadays we have this program active in uh, more, more or less 25% uh, uh, of our canteens, saving uh, 140 tons per year. As well, in our um, uh, vegetable wholesale market, that is again another municipal agency uh, in which uh, we establish uh, direct donation with uh, the NGOs, with the uh, food banks. And here you can see the number of uh, the data of uh, fruit and vegetable that we are able to save from that uh, infrastructure. Starting with uh, these two main uh, infrastructure, allowing us also to establish a relation with the private sector and to understand the different uh, policy that we can implement uh, working with them. And one of the main uh, uh, element that we work, that we propose to the private sector is a fiscal incentives. Uh, because uh, one, in the same period in Italy uh, was launched a national law that allowing the different municipality to establish uh, a tax reduction, of the, a waste tax reduction for the part uh, that we are able to donate. And so we launched this pilot action also in Milan, engaging more than uh, uh, more about 50 uh, supermarkets, so 50 retailers, uh, a set of pilot big retailers within uh, the general, the general uh, 
vegetable market and also again school canteen and also with a small uh, um, a pilot with small uh, retailers and this allowing us to map the different uh, the different um, retailers that are uh, interested in uh, donate their food losses their food losses and so we prepare based on all this data a set a, a new project uh, that are the local food waste hub is a set of neighborhood food banks um, that nowadays are free already already open and uh, ongoing and to in uh, in the process of design but uh, allowing us to engage all the supermarket of milan all the company and for each neighborhood uh, propose to all of them to be part of this local network the local network is very very easy very simple uh, there are more or less uh, from 10 to 20 supermarkets, so retailers uh, connected to each hub and a set also of uh, um, private canteen, company canteens. In the morning, there is a, a, a van, a small van that go in their, in their, uh, in their uh, uh, spaces to collect food loss, edible food losses and stock in uh, our local food waste stuff. And in the afternoon, the different charities and NGOs can go there to take their, uh, their food that they can uh, exploit for the people in need. Here you can see some uh, data in which uh, the blue uh, columns are uh, the kilograms of food donation monitor monthly. We have uh, a university that allowing us to, to, to have this kind of, uh, uh, of uh, data assessment. And also we monitor the percentage of the donation of the total of the losses. And this is very useful for us because uh, it's also important to share this data also with uh, retailers to understand the different quantity of food, the specific kind of, uh, of food to understand if they are able to prevent uh, also the, the food losses, the food surplus. We also work a lot with, uh, again, with school canteens, we've also with uh, the teachers and with uh, the parents uh, by spreading this doggy bag, but allowing the, the child to take the, the leftover of uh, fruit, uh, yogurt and, uh, and bread directly at home. It's also an element in which we start uh, with a simple element, with a simple uh, tool, uh, a bag, a reusable uh, bag. Uh, we can uh, start uh, a conversation about uh, food waste. And here you can have uh, a general overview of uh, all the circular economy approaches regarding uh, our uh, uh, bio waste in Milan and also in which we put also the part uh, of uh, the recovering uh, of food losses and uh, the food donation. It's important because allowing us also to understand if there are room of innovation in the, to in the topic of uh, fiscal incentives as well uh, to saving our money because uh, manage uh, in a plant our bio waste have a cost. If we are able to save the, 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 the food losses, we can have a saving for our municipal budget. And so our intention is to collect uh, this saving to maintain active uh, maintain active uh, the, the activities of uh, our uh, third sector partner for facilitate and improve uh, the donation. Uh, thank you for involving me. Here are some photos of the people that are working with me within the municipality and also outside in our municipal agency and in our partner of the cities. Uh, thanks again and uh, I stay here with you. Thank you so much, uh, Andrea. Um, yeah, the work's absolutely amazing and it's uh, really exciting. I've seen a few questions come in and, and we're going to cycle back through into questions uh, in the next uh, little while right after uh, Dana's presentation. So I think we're going to hit a lot of interesting themes that will uh, lead to some good conversation. So Dana, over to you. We're able to share the screen. Oh, can you hear me there? All yes, right. Yes. Just getting my sharing going here. Uh, we practiced and just want to make sure. All right. Are you seeing the presentation there? Okay, great. Let me make it big. 
Hello, everyone. So nice to be here with you, Dana Gunders. Um, I'm the executive director of ReFed. We are a national nonprofit in the U.S. that is entirely focused on reducing food loss and waste um, here within the U.S. And we do that by focusing on data and insights, um, on bringing more capital into the space, and on engaging stakeholders in the issue. Um, we did an analysis, and I'll, I'll just breeze through this because we've had a lot of numbers thrown at you, but um, for the U.S., where we really looked at all of the surplus food and where it was going. And what we found is that about 35% of all food in the U.S. went unsold or uneaten. Only about 3% of that actually was donated. Um, uh, an increasing percent recycled, meaning composted, gone to animal feed, um, those types of destinations. But really, the vast majority, about 70%, is still going to waste landfills, um, incineration, or down the drain. Uh, the value of that food is about $408 billion, which makes it 2% of the U.S. GDP. And of course, as we've already heard, a lot of impacts um, within the U.S., we estimate that it represents about 4% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions and, of course, a huge amount of water. And, and land use, and then to add insult to injury, food is actually the number one product entering our landfills today. And, and all the while, while, while we're seeing quite a bit of food insecurity. Um, just to look at trends for a moment, you know, we actually conducted our analysis back to the year 2010, that baseline year of all those international goals. And we found that, um, Rather than decreasing from that baseline year, we've actually seen uh, food loss and waste increase over that time up until about 2016, where it started to level off um, because population was still increasing over that time on a per capita basis. We actually see that um, that inflection point around 2016 is when when levels did start to decrease. So we now see ourselves about 2% um, below per capita below that six, 2016 number and, and back to about 2014 levels, but very far from our 50% reduction goal. So a lot of work to be done. I did wanna take a moment to talk, You know, we are here to talk about circular economy. And I think when people think about that with food, um, sometimes people really get stuck in that, in that circle concept, right? And, and uh, I've oftentimes heard people really jump straight to that, um, the composting, right? Or, or, you know, how do we take all those scraps or all those extras or even, you know, with the, with upcycling, all those extras and how do we do something with that? I don't wanna lose that actually, and this is straight from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation that actually really built into that circular economy concept is preventing food from becoming surplus in the first place. Um, you know, trying to have it be used as much as possible. Um, and that is, you know, their, as they state, their number one priority here first is how do we prevent food from, um, you know, becoming unsold, becoming extra, and how do we just keep it in that intentional food system? Um, and once we've done that, then, you know, let's look to how do we re redistribute it and then transform. Um, I do think all of that added, added valorization of upcycled food products does sort of still belong here in that prevent concept. Um, and then, of course, in that transformation, you know, can we create new food products, new um, agricultural products, materials like plastics, et cetera? Um, all right. Well, you're all probably familiar with our international and, and also in the U.S., we've adopted a 50 percent goal to reduce food loss and waste by 2030. At ReFed, we did an analysis to really look at, well, how do we get there? And what we did is we... Um, actually went in and explored a whole bunch of solutions because um, it's great to have these targets. It's great to start measuring. That really helps, uh, you know, focus where we put our efforts in. But then how do we act? What are we actually asking people to do? How much do those things cost and how well do they work? And that's what we really set out to explore in, an, in a tool that we call the Refed Insights Engine. Um, so here you can see, we started off with a list of about 80 different solutions. Um, they, we categorize them into seven different action areas, as we call them. 
Um, these first five all fall within that prevention mindset. You know, how do we keep the food in the food system um, as in sort of that intentional food system? This sixth one is really about rescuing food, um, but still keeping it in, you know, food as food. And then all of those recycling um, solutions fall into this last seven. The reason you see different colors here is because while we started off with a list of about 80 different solutions, we were not able to model all of them. We still know they're good solutions, so we like to, to keep them on the lists and in the mix, but we, but we were able to model about 40 of them. Um, and we looked at both how much does it cost to implement? Um, well, first of all, how much food does it save? Um, and then how much would it cost to implement those solutions? And how much um, might it save in, in food savings or other costs, um, labor savings, and how much revenue might it create? And what are the net economics of that? Uh, we also explored the impacts of that. And I will try to take you over for a very quick peek of what our tool looks like. Um, and I encourage you all to come and, and I'll drop the, um, the, the URL for this in in the chat when I'm done. Um, but this is our insights engine tool. It has several ways to explore. I'm just going to show you two, two of the tools right now, but I encourage you to come and explore more. So this first, this one is our solutions database. And here you see those seven action areas. And we can, and what you can do is depending on what you are looking for, you can actually explore, you know, which are the top solutions for financial purposes, you know, if you're just looking at tons. Um, for climate impact, et cetera. Um, and you can do that in a, by the category, but you can also look at the individual solutions that we've explored. Um, and depending on what you care about, the solutions will sort of change there. Um, if you represent a particular sector, you can look at that as well. So let's say you are working with the retailers in your community. You can come in and you can look at the solutions that really pertain to retailers. Um, so you can see that from the, the economic side, you know, these would be the top, the top solutions at that systems level. You can also come in and that, that's that systems level, but you could also look at it on a per ton basis, which really gives you the like bang for buck of each of these solutions. Um, if you're curious to learn more, you can actually click in and learn more about those solutions um, and, and just see some more details. Um, you, we also have a directory, which I won't click into right now, that has about uh, 900 different organizations that are providing some of these solutions. So if you liked this solution, you could come over here and find the organizations that are providing those solutions. Um, I do want to show you one other tool, which we call our impact calculator. And we found that, and I know there's a lot of local government um, folks on the phone, and we found that this is a really popular tool for local governments um, because it makes it very easy to estimate the impact, uh, both the footprint of any food loss and waste happening within your community, but also the impact of some changes. So you can come in and say, you know, at the residential level, and you can look at your, um, you can pick a, a particular product or do a standard mix. You can pick your units and then you put in, you know, right now we have, let's say 10,000 um, tons of food going to landfill and right here it will, it will give you um, the footprint of that. But you can also compare that. Well, what if we really emphasize just as Milan has done? What if we really um, try to emphasize food donation and, and improve on that? And, you know, that meant that 2000 of those tons got donated. And only 8,000 were going to landfill, what would be the impact of that? And it will very quickly give you some of the greenhouse gas savings, water footprint, and potential meals that you could recover. Um, so we found that to be a popular tool. I encourage you, there's a lot more on here, so please do come check it out, but I know we wanna have time for questions. So I will stop there and uh, thank you all. Thank you so much, Dana. Um, I can say from experience working on a on a food project, we've all spent a lot of time on your solution, uh, your solution engine. Just thinking about, okay, this is what we want to do, and and it's just here are literally almost all the things we could think of to do, and how we can arrange it. And um, for you know someone doing it, it's such a useful uh, database to touch on. That's great. We love hearing that. <laughs>
Um, so to start the conversation, uh, there's a number of questions that have come in, which is great. Um, but let me start off first by talking a little bit about um, cities, because I think three of us are thinking about, you know, cities and the urban environment a bit. Um, and then maybe contrast with Dana, who's a bit more of an, an NGO focus. So uh, maybe uh, Andrea, to start with you. So much of this work around creating a sustainable food system starts in cities with with local governments. Um, Milan uh, is, you know, working on the Milan Pact, which is the network of cities all committed to this around the world. Um, so I guess, what is it in your view that puts the city kind of um, at the center of a lot of these discussions? And and what are cities doing around circular food specifically, sort of in, in the ones you're working with? Yeah, thank you. Uh... I think that cities are the perfect place to try to re relocalize the local food system. So after the Second World War, we work a lot, all the countries work a lot to try to connect to other countries, to share goods and services, to share food. And, uh, but uh, this is broken all of our local food system. But uh, until the Second World War, we were very closer to, to cities, so very closer to the people. And uh, the cities, uh, since uh, the last uh, 20 years, more or less, but uh, um, primarily in, during uh, 2015, when we start uh, proposing this international journey to collect uh, all, the effort or, uh, all the effort of cities, uh, we launch uh, this Milan Urban Food Policy Pact, that, as you mentioned, nowadays uh, committed uh, more than 200 of uh, mayors working together on this topic. And we try to establish the biggest uh, world community of uh, mayor and city officer working on food. Food waste become one of the main elements uh, that are tackling because uh, uh, in that period wasn't so active uh, the cities on food waste. So we're much more easy to start a new field of area. Uh, the majority of cities are working on school canteens, on markets, on uh, local agriculture. But food waste wasn't at that period a big topic of uh, discussion. And we have a lot of evidence of this because we launch, you also in the same period in which we launch the PACT, an award among uh, that cities, that is the Milan PACT Award, that uh, for one side allowing us to see the much more active and innovative practices, but on the other hand, and on my side is the much important of this award, allowing us to monitor the effort uh, of that mayor, of those mayors after the sign of the part. So aren't not just uh, a sign, but uh, is a very strong commitment uh, on that um, on that seat, on those cities. And food waste uh, at that period from 2017 wasn't so um, wasn't submitted a lot of practices on food waste. In the last years are more active, and uh, the cities are trying to become a good platform for private sector, for NGOs, neutral, because we haven't uh, private interest, we haven't other kind of interest uh, on uh, let us uh, see this work uh, itself. And so we are a good platform to engage uh, uh, actors to work uh, in a sustainable point of view. And the food waste is one of the main elements. Um, Dan, can I, can I get your perspective? Working from an NGO at a national level, do you see cities as kind of the core or what are some of the other actors that you see as being key to this, whether inside or outside government? I see cities as probably the number one most motivated actor on this issue, to, to be honest. And I think it's for three reasons. I think they have a waste problem, they have a food insecurity problem, and they have a climate goal. And so, it, you know, working on this kind of hits all three of those things. So I see them as very motivated. I. I also see them struggling to figure out exactly what they should be doing, um, you know, because they really either they're sort of relying on the participation of businesses, which is sometimes better than trade, right? and it sort of depends on what that relationship is to begin with, um, or they're trying to get their residents to change behavior. And I think that, of course, you know, has its own presents its own challenges. Um, so, but, but nevertheless, I mean, there's more and more cities working on this. There are like regional groups where they're really trying to share and learn from each other. So, and I think it's, they're a critical pivot point. And I think we need to 
really make use of all that motivation and, and help them figure out exactly what their best um, implementation steps are. Other, other folks we see getting involved, um, more and more the, the brands and manufacturers mm -hmm. Uh, somewhat motivated by the 10 by 20 by 30 initiative where big retailers really got a lot of brands to commit to this goal. Um, retailers, I think we see um, bigger food service companies, um, especially in university settings or other all you can eat settings where there's a direct benefit. Um, you know, I think where we see less action is in the restaurant industry where it it's challenged because a lot of the waste is after the food is sold. And I think there's like this real tension in um, motivations there, right? And incentives because, you know, it just, and, and, and then add on COVID on top of that and you get a really challenged environment. So I think, you know, um, on the retail and brand side, we're seeing some good action on the, um, on the food service side, they're struggling with so many things right now. It's maybe not the best place to be focusing for the moment. Yeah, and and I think on that one of the challenges too is that you know for so much food waste in at least in, in our context in sort of the institutional, commercial, and industrial sectors, that stuff goes to landfill. Most residential areas, a lot of residential areas um, have composting, so that food waste is of course bad, but it is composted. Um, and so we're actually working on some projects right now to try and um, help those who want to compost um, if you're a restaurant to do that. Um, and then there's policy things that other jurisdictions have done, like a number of US states that have, that have banned um, organics and landfill, which is another um, better option if, if you can get a higher level of government to do that sort of thing. Absolutely. I think those bans are probably the number one most effective thing because not only do they drive like development of all that composting infrastructure, but they also that that practice of separating, right, really allows for measurement in a new way and also just makes it visible in a new way. And so it's it's a pretty important first step that we've seen in states like Massachusetts where they've had a ban that it not only diverts um, the waste to composting, but it actually has double donations and, you know, provided a little more incentive for prevention. I think the way you structure those bans, depending on like allowing waivers and things like that for a certain level of prevention can, can really help um, incentivize that as well. So I want to jump to one of the questions in, in the, from the audience. Um, so this is from Dennis D. So how do farmers or food processors get to know about different ways food can be returned into the supply cycle in terms of possible range of applications for certain food wastes, i.e. Uh, producing paint from coffee grounds? So how do we connect effectively the waste with the innovation um, to solve it? Does anybody want to jump on that first? I have some thoughts based on what some of the stuff we're doing. Um, so, I mean, I think this is, I think this is one of the challenges is that for a lot of materials, they don't necessarily have that defined secondary market where there's a lot of value beyond necessarily composting or something that is, is edible for people or edible for animals. So like the example of, of producing paint from coffee grounds. So I think that is, that's still a real challenge to sort of, you know, build those innovations, but then to build those innovations, you need those sustainable secondary markets. Somebody ripped up my driveway a little while ago and took that asphalt and took it to um, a construction company in town that recycles that. And that happens seamlessly because there's a secure secondary market. So we need, I think, combined, you know, innovations to be developed, companies that can commercialize those innovations and be sustainable and do that, and then sustainable markets that will, you know, make those companies function by giving supplies mm -hmm. to actually work all of that. Um, and I think forums like this to share best practices are, are key to that. Anybody else have thoughts on sort of innovations you've seen? Well, I, I just want to briefly build on, on, on some of the things you say, David, because I think indeed, like, of course, communication is one of the bigger things, right? So we first need to understand where certain uh, secondary uh, products emerge, right? Like, so not only how much of it is there, but also where is it? Um, because I think a lot of business cases require uh, some sort of like critical mass 
to have a business case, right? So I think it's like one understanding where these things occur, also getting the information uh, to the to the the actors that are producing them, but then also thinking about and and this is something that we see with our aquaponics greenhouse, but also comes across in our work a lot is these enabling assets, right? And you touch upon it, you say business cases and actually learning from each other. So, uh, of course, Dana's platform already is amazing. Like, um, I didn't know it, so I'm just going to like spend the rest of my evening looking through it. But, <laughs> but um, also thinking about like, how can we have these open source, yeah, ready-made business cases so that we can really like amplify that in the market and that we can really scale that up. I think um, having these assets there is key as well. Mm -hmm. And if I can also give a, a short plug, um, I mentioned we launched an accelerator a while ago called Coil, and as part of that, it's at coil.eco, if you want to look. Um, our colleagues at, um, uh, uh, we're working on, on an incubator right now that'll work on exactly that, where uh, we'll work with partners to go through particular materials, do analysis on them, and discover, you know, what nutritional things could be turned into. Um, and our pro colleagues at ProVision Coalition are, are doing some amazing work there. Um, we're running out of time, uh, but we have a good question here around um, if we can avoid food loss, therefore use less land to produce food, is there a circular economy vision to rewild that land? Um, and is, is that a part of conversations you're working with? So to me, this goes to a little bit of questions around, you know, the urban and rural and how do we make sure that, you know, rural areas benefit from this, both from, you know, a sustainability and, and economic development side and from um, biodiversity and, and nature. I could take that one. Um, it's a great question. And I just had a whole discussion about it yesterday related to the climate footprint, right? Because it's, it's pretty directly related. Um, I think the, the important thing to think about here is that food demand is not static. Right, we are looking at a growing population. The, the UN and others are predicting we will need about 50% more food by 2050 than we have today. So, I don't, I, while I would love to see lands rewild, rewilded, I think really probably what we're talking about is trying to freeze the footprint of agriculture while demand continues to increase rather than you know actively shrinking it um i think that's probably more realistic so the idea would be you know we continue to serve more people with the same amount of food because you know the reality is we have more food than we need today i think all along these lines there's some really interesting work happening around regenerative agriculture as well and you see a lot of big brands are really you know pushing this down in their supply chain um, and I mean, in the States, there's some amazing work where, you know, farmers are, are now, you know, generating revenue from carbon and many other places as well. And, you know, so, uh, putting in place regenerative techniques, which will allow for greater biodiversity and, and things like, you know, mixed cropping and, uh, things that don't necessarily rewild land, but grow food in a different way, um, achieves part of that. And I think we, we should also not forget that the changing. Our diets is also going to have a massive impact there, and we already see that transition happening. So once we go towards that, um, I think there's uh, lots of opportunities there on top of what you've already said. There is also a room of innovation in the topic of uh, ecosystem services. So if we think that the city are the center of a wider land uh, of a territory, we need also to understand if the farmers, the local farmers, can be play other role besides producing food. Uh, they aren't uh, in a desert, uh, they are closer to the city, and this is an added value. And one of the main elements is uh, to understand if uh, the ecosystem services, but we need to start thinking in the field of uh, economy to how we can connect the fluxes of our cities, can be the, one of the next paradigm that we need to deliver to better connect the rural and the urban area. Otherwise, need uh, just to short supply chain, but aren't just supply chain. Well, thank you so much for everyone uh, joining today. Um, there's more questions. I'm, I'm sorry we didn't get to more of them. Um, we'll send an email around to all attendees shortly after with links to the presentations and a video of the press and the video of the of the session. Um, and I could have a lot longer conversation with all of you. So I'm sorry we only have an hour. 
Um, thank you so much and uh, really appreciate all of your participation today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's great. Bye bye. Thanks so much, bye. everyone. Hey, see bye ya. Bye. Thank you.